try and uh, move around a little less frantically and a little less hectically. Somebody compared uh, my lectures to aerobics classes. Because you know? <laughs> um, um, I'm thinking of uh, Baldo's uh, previous Cetra experience and that I might provoke uh, an earthquake, you know, uh, if I keep this up for, uh, for too long. Um, what I'm going to try and do uh, this morning are uh, a number of, of things that partly come out of work for this globalization book and partly some research that I'm in engaging in uh, at present with a view to a future publication. Um, and basically what I'm going to, to do this morning is, 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 is four things. Um, the first thing that I want to do is to look at in what specific ways has the sort of the economy of the world that we live in changed in the last two, two decades. Um, secondly, I want to look at the localization industry and certain, if you like, dissident voices in the localization uh, industry. Uh, thirdly, I want to look at a question that was raised at our first uh, session. Um, Yves Gambier uh, referred to it. And this is the question of, of time and how time features in the, the translation uh, process. And lastly, I want to look at the whole question of multiculturalism, inter culturalism, transculturalism, and what this means for uh, translation studies, because it seems to me that one of the most important areas that this discipline will be heading over the next few years is uh, more and more central involvement in these questions, which are uh, crucial to the political survival, it seems to me, of, of many parts of the, of the planet. Okay, so let me start with the, um, the change in sort of the economic uh, setup uh, globally. Uh, and one of the reasons I want to look at this is, and one of the reasons why I wrote the globalization book, is that I was very surprised uh, that in so much of writing about translation, there was a kind of an assumption that the economy and the sort of political economy of societies was somehow uh, constant or unchanging. In other words, that, you know, there was different uh, changes in translation. Uh, translation was responding to new demands, but there was never any attempt to explain, well, well what was driving these, these new demands? What was, what was the kind of, in what way was the way in which the world was doing uh, business and thinking about its e economy uh, changing? Because it seems to me in order to think deeply about uh, translation and the kind of various mutations in translation, you had to understand this larger uh, picture. So let me just give you three elements, it seems to me, that are crucial in the change uh, for this, of this larger picture. So that we, um, this is the wrong, you don't get very far because you're using a highlighter. Um, so the first change is the shift from Fordism to post Fordism. Fordism is basically the form of economic activity that uses the mass production of uh, goods in order to generate economic uh, growth. In other words, the idea is uh, that, that Ford discovers is that the more you produce of particular goods, um, the smaller the cost of producing each one of those individual goods. And Fordist uh, production for most of the 20th century was something that was uh, driving, if you like, so much of economic growth. The sort of the high period of Fordist production is, in fact, the post-Second World War period. And what's interesting about that is that Fordist um, production of the Fordist model was not just a question of uh, mass production, of mass manufacturing. It also extended to the organization of society, the mass provision of social and educational services through uh, the welfare uh, state, uh, the rise of mass tourism 
in the post-1945 period, uh, the rise of the package holiday, the industrialization of the leisure industry and so on. The idea being is that mass provision was uh, cheaper for the producers to produce, it was cheaper for the consumers to uh, consume, and all this uh, generated uh, growth and uh, income. This is a model that um, serves certain parts of the world well uh, until uh, the 1970s, when for a number of reasons, partly to do with, the, with increasing uh, energy costs, partly to do with the saturation of consumer markets in uh, the more affluent parts of the world with these mass-produced uh, goods, it was a kind of a, uh, an exhaustion, there was um, gradually a shift to what's called post-Fordist production. What characterizes post-Fordist uh, production is that you have high-volume flexible production. What that means is that you produce um, quantities of a product very, very uh, quickly, but you change the nature of that product uh, very, very frequently. In other words, that if you uh, order a computer from Dell, uh, you, can, you order uh, a kind of customized or a sort of a tailor-made uh, computer with the, the particular things that, 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 that you want. In other words, under the old Fordist regime, if you wanted to produce a model of a car um, or a washing machine or whatever, um, you had to mechanically construct your plant so that you could produce the model. So introducing variations into the model was very expensive because you had to change the physical uh, plant. What happens with the arrival of uh, new technology is um, you are able to uh, change the production of uh, a good uh, much, much, much more easily. Because the thing about software is that a piece of software will turn, this is what Turing, this is Alan Turing's uh, central uh, intuition, is that if you take a piece of software, you can turn your computer into an accountant, you put in financial software, you put in uh, educational software into your computer, you can turn it into uh, a teacher. Um, you put uh, games software into your uh, computer and it becomes sort of a, a board game. Uh, so that the, the idea being that what software uh, allows one to do is to radically uh, alter the functions of the actual machines that, that you have. What, means, what that means is that you're able to respond to changes in consumer preferences, uh, etc., in a very short period of time so that you get flexibility in the production process. This is the period where we're going to get the exponential growth in the advertising uh, industry, uh, which is driving changes in consumer preferences. So the idea being that how growth gets generated in the post-Fordist economy um, is through increasingly short, short, and short, and short cycles of existence. It's people changing uh, goods, uh, changing conveyed by increasingly uh, short cycles. But what, if you like, the new invention technology allows you to do is to precisely that kind of, of thing, that the computers allow you to have this high-volume, flexible uh, production. Of course, what that implies um, is the centrality of information technology to the production process. I'll say a bit more about this uh, in a minute. The second feature of this economy is what's called Toyotism. Um, Toyotism is basically the notion of um, lean production. Lean production, time to market. The idea being that what one should aim for in producing uh, goods in the economy is to keep goods moving as quickly as possible. In other words, that the goal should be to get the good from the factory to the warehouse, to the shop, to the consumer as quickly as possible. Because 
if at any point in that process um, the, the good is remaining in one place for too long, whether in the warehouse or in the shop or whatever, that's costing money. So the whole thing is to get the good to the market as quickly as possible, uh, to get the person in the market consume it as quickly as possible, and to then to generate demand for more uh, goods. Um, what that crucially implies is that you have information. In other words, that the information from the cash desk in the shop gets back to the factory as quickly as possible, so they can produce uh, more goods, which can then be sent to the warehouse, and then to the, uh, the shop and so on. Hmm? So what you're crucially, again, dependent on is information uh, inputs. The third <coughs> feature of this period is decentralization of production. What I mean by that is that a phenomenon that appears in the 1970s is that increasingly production moves away from high-cost centers of uh, production to other parts of uh, the world where it becomes uh, cheaper to uh, produce or process uh, goods and services of, uh, different, of different kinds. Now, of course, that becomes possible because through information technology operating in real time, it's possible for you to manage globally um, a production, distribution, and management uh, operation. What this means, of course, is um, a shift to what um, somebody might have quoted um, on a number of occasions in, in, in my lectures, Castells argues that we are into a new economic paradigm which he calls informationalism. What he means by that is that there are, he, said, he would see there are three periods in the development of the sort of political economy of the, uh, the West. He would say the first period is the agricultural mode of the so consequences are still very, very uh, much with us. But in the informational mode, what becomes crucial, if you like, in driving economic uh, productivity is uh, the acquisition of uh, information, Not defenses, public arguments about uh, localization, is that it's a, a way of protecting <coughs> linguistic specificity and cultural difference. Um, let me just quote um, from a man called uh, Dev said. So, um, someone who has um, done quite a bit of work. And participate and keep their own identities at the same time. Right? So it's carrying this information across the globe. And a man called uh, Richard Shida has nationalist disposition, uh, you'll feel this is kind of British Unionist, whereas if you're British Unionist and you see a green screen, you think this is an Irish nationalist conspiracy to spoil your working day. So this kind of, um, so this can think about colour schemes, pictures, images, sounds, uh, symbols, historical uh, data, acronyms, product names. Um, that you know, these need to be changed um, when material is being localized it's been, uh, for different uh, markets and countries. But of course, the question that uh, needs to be, to be asked um, is to what extent um, localization generates the kinds of benefits that Hoppenrath uh, describes uh, or whether, in fact, it's simply that the real beneficiaries of this uh, process are the kind of corporate uh, giants who are bankrolling uh, various uh, transnational uh, corporations. Um, and it's interesting that in the localization community itself um, that, you know, debates are beginning to happen on this, this, this question, perhaps not enough. Um, but certainly, if I just give you one example, 
a man called uh, Reinhard Scheler, who is based in one of the universities in Ireland, the University of, of Limerick, and who is one of the foremost figures in localization education. He's the editor of Localization Focus, one of the uh, magazines in the, the area. He is the director of the International Localization uh, Summer School. He's one of the founding members of the Institute of Localization uh, Professionals. And in a recent article in uh, Localization uh, Focus, um, he turns out to be extremely critical of the uh, localization industry. And he says, um, I want to quote him here, around 90%, he says, of the overall globalization effort is invested in the localization of U.S. developed digital material. In other words, localization is currently used almost exclusively by large U.S. corporations as a vehicle to increase their profits. What, is the, what, you know, what, what are the kinds of arguments uh, or the basis for his, uh, his critique? We see the kind of three elements um, to it. Um, the first problem that he identifies is that he feels that localization, in fact, makes worse rather than um, better the uh, digital divide in the planet today. And why does he say that? Again, it's something we can argue with, but just let's listen to the argument for a moment. Um, he would argue that what localization uh, can tend to do is that it provides local elites with access to uh, information in uh, their own uh, language, um, which, if you like, in some ways tends to copper fasten, uh, tends to strengthen the kind of social and economic position of uh, those elites getting access to information over uh, other people in the uh, society. And, you know, he puts this in the context of the fact that over nine-tenths of uh, humanity do not have uh, access to uh, personal uh, computers. Um, and just perhaps to uh, kind of contextualize this a little, when I was working on the uh, globalization book, one of the more interesting results that I found coming out of work in the area of sociolinguistics and linguistic uh, ecology uh, was that very, very many of the world's languages, 6,000 languages that currently uh, exist, that very, very many of those languages are being threatened, not so much by global languages um, such as uh, English, Spanish, or or whatever, but in fact by, you take for example Botswana, um, which is a, a very linguistically uh, complex uh, makeup, um, the big danger for many languages in Botswana is not so much uh, English as Setswana, uh, the, the national vernacular, which is putting a lot of pressure on, on the language because it's the kind of the language of the local uh, elites. Uh, so this question of, you know, uh, the digital divide, localization, and the position of, of, of uh, local elites uh, needs to be uh, considered. Another problem that uh, Shaler identifies is that you see one of the things that's constantly referred to in the literature around uh, localization, people in the industry talking about it, is the notion of reusability. In other words, that the less stuff you actually have to, to translate, the more you can actually reuse, the cheaper it's going to be. Because right? you can just you can recycle, you can reuse uh, the material. Um, and he says then that as a result, designers of global products, of websites aimed at the global customer, use globally acceptable standards, symbols, and uh, conventions. Um, now, I think his, his phrasing there is slightly unfortunate um, because he's, he's making an assumption. But I think what, he, what he's trying to get at is that what becomes the default value is what you can kind of recycle as much as possible. So if you can kind of uh, reuse as much as possible um, icons or symbols or, 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 or whatever. Or the, 
Dutch novelist um, says, oops, perhaps says that wrong. Um, in one of his uh, recent <coughs> books, says that the, um, the longer uh, we live, it seems, the less time we have. Right? Um, that the more labor-saving devices uh, we uh, buy for ourselves, uh, the more incredibly busy uh, we seem to uh, become. Um, one of the uh, most uh, interesting writers on this topic is a Norwegian sociologist called uh, Thomas Eland Eriksson, who in a book called The Tyranny of the Moment, uh, Slow Time in the Information Age, claims that the biggest problem that we have at present is um, not uh, that we don't have enough information, that we have too much of it, and that information is disabling us rather than enabling us. That there's a kind of, so in this kind of informational paradigm, um, information is, 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 is driving a certain kind of productivity, uh, but on another level, it's uh, actually proving to be quite, uh, quite crippling. Let's put this in the context of the translation industry. Um, IDC, um, the, it's an acronym for us, the International Documentation Corporation, uh, they estimate that if you look at the position of what they call the translation, interpretation, localization, and cross-linguistic applications market, no one thinks about English, you can pile up all these epithets. But, so the translation, localization, interpretation, and cross-linguistics application market, if we look at the market, it's kind of worth its market value in uh, 2001. It was worth around uh, 3 billion US dollars. What they project is that by the time we get to 2006, that will have increased to 6 billion uh, dollars. Um, Cyber Atlas, who uh, provides figures on internet usage, claimed that last year in uh, 2003, two thirds of the internet uh, users were uh, non uh, English uh, speakers. And they quote a number of surveys that said <coughs> that people who look at internet sites in their own language stay on that site four times longer than if it's in a, another language, in a foreign uh, language. The predictions are that the, the, if you like, the human translation segment uh, of the market is going to increase by approximately 6.5% over uh, the next uh, decade. So what that means, of course, is that the volumes that need to be uh, translated are increasing all the time. This is in a context where um, the rapidity, the quickness with which you get uh, information is of a premium because we're, we're, we're in this kind of post this Toyotist uh, uh, paradigm. Um, so this is generating enormous uh, pressures on the actual uh, translation uh, process. To give you an example of um, how this uh, has been expressed or some of the consequences, um, a man called, um, and I have to apologize to the, uh, the Dutch speakers in the audience, of which there are a considerable number, uh, for I'm going to, uh, well, Jose, how do you pronounce his? So simple. Ja van der Meer. Ah, Ja van der Meer. Oh. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> okay, well, uh, we've had a Flemish version of. Um, he is president, uh, or rather former uh, president and chief executive officer of an important player in the localization. Uh, Alpnet. 
And he, he was, for, for a time, someone who may have come across his, his material in, in language uh, technology. He was, he was an editor of that magazine. So he said in um, a recent article, he says, the industry's uh, growth, so translation industry, is currently suppressed by the complexity and cost of managing the translation supplier base. This reality is stimulating the growth of translation automation and transaction and workflow uh, automation. So what is the solution to this, 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 this increasing volumes of material that need to be translated? Uh, we're in this informationist uh, paradigm. Time is of the, uh, the essence. So what they're suggesting is the model of uh, web uh, services. So basically what web services um, does is that it allows you to connect uh, translation tools, uh, translators, uh, the, the suppliers of translation uh, services uh, automatically. Um, in other words, you construct a kind of uh, a system whereby uh, if you've got a website that needs to be updated fairly regularly, um, this is sent off uh, automatically through the, the system and it gets rooted in three different directions. It gets rooted to translation memories, it gets rooted to machine translation engines, and it gets rooted to uh, human uh, translators uh, working uh, freelance or for, for, for agencies. In other words, that the, the, the web services system itself right, will detect those parts of the text that have already been translated and then will use the translation memory route. Um, if there's a very uh, specific real-time cons constraint, uh, it will go the machine translation uh, route. Uh, and in other cases, it will go the uh, human uh, translator's uh, route. So the idea being that the kind of the optimal, um, the, the aim is to go for uh, as much sort of automation of the uh, translation process as is, is, is possible. Now, I want to try and situate the um, most influential writers into, into English. Um, and one of these are traders. Um, because he says a trader is a, is a funny kind of wanderer. He says, um, you know, we often, the, the wanderer is someone who's, sort of, who's here today and is, is gone tomorrow. Right? But he says a trader is someone who is here today and uh, stays to tomorrow. What Simo says is, and he's talking about the trader, he says the potential wanderer, so to speak, the, the trader, who, although he has gone no further, has not quite got over the freedom of coming and uh, going. Of course, this kind of stranger is omnipresent in economic activity. But why, or what is the kind of the origins of uh, his or her uh, presence? If you like, when people produce their own goods, right, or if the production and circulation of goods happens within a small, uh, restricted uh, community, uh, you don't really need a trader. You're, 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 sort of, uh, you're, you're self uh, sufficient. Um, but once you need goods that are produced, are only available outside the group, um, then you need the trader. You either need one of your own people sort of then goes out and sources the goods and becomes a kind of a stranger in that other place where he or she gets the, uh, the goods, or somebody comes to you as a trader bringing the, uh, the goods. And in some of the kind of intercultural mapping that, that Anthony Pym has done, you can see the way in which this uh, overlaps with certain kind of nexuses or centers of this kind of trading uh, activity. Um, if we look at how translation theoreticians have, or people who've written about translation, let us say, have referred to the activity of translation, it's interesting how often this gets links, linked to trading and to uh, commerce. Um, Goethe, in his review of um, Carlyle's uh, German translators, talks about this kind of uh, 
linguistic or cultural marketplace uh, where uh, all uh, nations offer their, their goods. And he says that anyone who studies German has kind of access to this marketplace where people from different nations and cultures are offering their goods. And he says the following. And this is how we should see the translator. As one who strives to be a mediator in this universal intellectual trade and makes it his business to promote exchange. For whatever one may say about the shortcomings of translations, they are and will remain most important and worthy undertakings in world uh, communication. So one of the crucial things about uh, trading, of course, as translation, is uh, mo mobility. Um, and, you know, it, it often occurs to me that, you know, we talk about, when I started uh, teaching and in, 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 in very ill for a uh, future course of this marriage, but anyway. Um, <laughs> so this is why I got this particular analogy in the brain. Um, whereas the thing about, um, about, about money is that um, I don't have to care about, your, uh, about our desires uh, co coinciding. Right? Once the money becomes this uh, accepted means of uh, a, a exchange, that's all that matters. Because that means that once you can take the money and then you can buy something at a later stage that, 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 that you want, right? The desires don't have to coincide in uh, time. So what happens then is that once you get the, the, the link, something that can link the various links in the teleological chain, well, this chain can become more and more and more complex. It can become more and more and more extended. Um, and, but you've got this universalized means of exchange, something that's holding it together, but also is accelerating the movement. It becomes much more, uh, things can circulate uh, with increasing speed and uh, rapidity. If you look at what the informatics revolution has meant in the latter half of the 20th century, is that uh, the digitalization of, of texts, uh, of images, of sounds, of pictures, uh, all this can be translated into uh, binary code, into a digital language. And this becomes the kind of link then uh, that uh, allows very complex things to, 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 to happen. It seems to me that one of the difficulties is how translation or translators um, fit into this picture. In other words, if, for example, the kind of web services model I was, I was describing could be seen as a kind of you know, complex teleological uh, chain um, where the premium is on things going through the system as quickly as, as, as possible, um, does the translator then himself or herself become a kind of universal or generalized medium of uh, exchange. In other words, does the question of time, in other words, the kind of speed of execution, annihilate space, the place of the, uh, the translator? And is there a sense in which um, a notion of transparent immediacy right, or instantaneity uh, leads to the desire to eliminate anything that, if you like, slows down or decelerates the, uh, the, the, the process. So that link, if you like, between the, the generation of, 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 of money through uh, trading, which is underlying uh, globalization, um, does not also have a, a, a consequence for translation so far as we're getting the interface of two things, one, the economic imperative driving uh, localization, um, but also the uh, digital digitalization, the kind of the, 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 the sort of the universality of, uh, of the code, um, which is uh, another force which is putting pressure on the specificity of the, uh, the translator. Remember what Hoppenrath said at the beginning. What multi um, localization is doing is that it's protecting uh, cultural difference and linguistic uh, diversity. And, you know, as I say, this is said over and over and over again. 
Another way of describing this is to say that what localization is doing is promoting multiculturalism. That in a multicultural society, that localization finds its role because it's providing people with information, uh, with content, with language, you know, in their own language, in their own uh, culture. Another way in which to refer to multiculturalism, the term that has been used, is the politics of uh, recognition. So, if you take the example of uh, Ireland's military uh, conflict last 30 years, kills thousands of people, uh, the British Army, you've got uh, a agreement. What does the Belfast Agreement say? Um, the British and Irish governments respect the cultural uh, identity and specificity of the uh, unionist pro-British and nationalist pro-Irish communities. So what we will do is we will recognize, protect, cherish these cultural differences rather than trying to impose an Irish nationalist identity or try to oppose a British unionist uh, identity. Um, the kind of language uh, of, of that uh, agreement is very much in keeping with uh, post-Cold War uh, thinking in uh, so many areas, which is that if you look at the whole rise of cultural studies, um, and particularly in its post-1989 uh, phase, is if we were having this conference or this seminar or these cetera lectures um, in the early 1970s, one of the words that I would be using as someone who is interested in the politics of translation would be class. I'd be talking about class and <clears throat> class struggle and class war and oppressed classes and dominant classes and so on. Right? So, but what you find in <coughs> a lot of post-89 uh, thinking, I'm just, these divisions, of course, are always a bit <coughs> artificial, but is that people are talking more about culture than they're talking about class. In other words, what we call the politics of identity has come uh, very much to the uh, fore. The problem, of course, uh, with uh, <coughs> politics of recognition and multiculturalism is that you can end up um, codifying and defining uh, cultures, putting them into you know, recognizable uh, boxes that can, in fact, be uh, something that is ultimately very disabling rather than something that's enabling. For example, one of the reasons for the conflict in Northern Ireland in the first place was because people uh, were particularly preoccupied with cultural distinctness and cultural separateness. So you're then coming up with an agreement um, that's based precisely on that kind of uh, culturalist uh, thinking. So it seems to me that the, one of the difficulties when we're thinking about uh, localization is that it's not just a question of you know, selling goods and services to, to different um, people, but we may be buying into um, what um, a graduate student of mine, uh, Gavin Titley, has called um, consumer uh, nationalism. Um, what does he mean by consumer nationalism? Um, he says it's the surveying and protecting uh, surveying and protecting images of national cultural difference because of their connotative capital in a burgeoning global consumer uh, society. And people talk about this, that you brand particular countries, that a, a country has got, you know, in a kind of global consumer market, um, that, that countries must kind of brand themselves in particular ways in order to be perceived as uh, distinct and therefore uh, as uh, attractive. Take the recent uh, trade mission by the Irish government to, uh, to China, where uh, they were looking for investment opportunities for uh, the country. 
Um, what did they do in the three weeks before the trade mission went? They organized a three-week-long Irish cultural festival in China, uh, where you may have seen uh, river dance. You know, uh, so um, I could try this after midnight. Uh, <laughs> might come in handy for the football match, you know, some of this. Um, but uh, anyway, this was uh, an enormous uh, success in, 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 in Beijing and, uh, and in Shanghai. And the, the, the idea, of course, uh, being that this would you know, promote the image of art as a distinctive sort of uh, location in the sort of uh, global uh, consumer uh, market. And of course, this change is bound up with a very important change in the nature of, of, of goods that are produced in a lot of the um, more affluent economies, which is what we call the production not of primary or secondary goods, but of informational or aesthetic goods. In other words, that uh, something like a piece of, of uh, software is an informational good. It's, it's what you're paying for is the knowledge. I mean, the actual bit of software, it's not the plastics, is pretty much well, it doesn't cost much, it's, it's worthless, but it's the actual content that makes it, ex you know, makes it expensive to, to buy and to, to, to produce. Similarly, when you buy a CD, it's what we call uh, an aesthetic good, that you're partly buying the CD because you, know, you like the music, you like uh, Coldplay, you like the way in which the, uh, the cover is uh, designed, and that's why you, you pay exorbitant prices for CDs. Uh, you know, it's the actual you know, the design or the cultural elements that's, that's built into these products that makes them uh, expensive. So in a certain kind of economic activity, uh, you know, kind of cultural or aesthetic and informational uh, components are very much uh, to the center. So that the, the link between a country's economic activity and its cultural identity become uh, very closely uh, bound up. The difficulty, however, is that if we um, go for this uh, model of um, the politics of recognition, that what you end up with is that cultural uh, identities become reified. You know, you, you, people are ascribed certain uh, differences, and that is then said to uh, define you. But also, um, this kind of... Um, culturalist uh, approach tends to decouple identity from um, the social and political context in which people from different uh, languages and cultures meet each other. In other words, there is what's sometimes referred to as kind of consumerist cosmopolitanism. You, know, you live in this wonderful kind of you know, multicultural world because you can go to the Thai restaurant uh, and you can wear your Indian uh, sandals and go home and uh, have uh, a cup of uh, English uh, tea and then go out and have uh, a glass of Japanese sake or whatever. Right? And you know this is, 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 is wonderful and it's part of the kind of the richness of the globe, etc., cetera, uh, etc. Cetera. But meanwhile, back at the ranch, um, people from different immigrant communities are uh, working extremely long hours in very poor service jobs, or large sections of humanity have difficulty accessing the most uh, basic parts of the kind of ICT uh, infrastructure and so on. So the kind of a decoupling of, of culture from uh, sort of political economy of uh, how people uh, live their uh, lives. Um, now, of course, this concern with culture that's to the fore uh, in the public defense of localization, the kind of multi uh, cultural juxtaposition of uh, cultural uh, differences is quite uh, understandable at one level because you know, why, 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 why are we concerned so much with this, this question's business of, of culture? Um, it's because it's an important dimension to our sense of self, our sense of self-respect, a sense of where we've come from, uh, a sense of, of place, um, the way in which we uh, express ourselves. But should we not begin to think in localization and in, 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 in translation studies uh, more generally of the notion perhaps of living culturally 
rather than living in cultures. Um, what I mean by that is that you would you, you acknowledge the importance of what you might call a community of dissent, that the fact that you know, there's a critical mass of people in a particular place that happen to share uh, a number of things in, in, in common. Um, but at the same time, you recognize the fact that people have all kinds of multiple uh, allegiances. In other words, that societies are both, and cultures are both internally complex, but that they are externally networked. That, that this, you know, it's, it's a bit like this kind of transnational uh, uh, transnationalism that I was uh, speaking about uh, yesterday. So that if we take Susan Basson's description of what was happening in translation studies and cultural studies, she said that in the 70s, early 80s, we had what she calls the cultural turn in uh, translation studies. Then she says what happens in the 90s, um, although I think she's been excessively optimistic in her uh, conclusions here, but she says there was the translation turn in cultural studies. People, various parts of cultural studies, got interested in uh, translation. Perhaps what we should be trying to look for uh, now, and you know, Anthony's been a, a pioneer in, the, in this area, is to look at the intercultural turn in translation studies. Uh, in other words, that to get away from what seems to me to be the essentialist kind of differentialism of uh, multiculturalism to uh, the notion of the, the, the intercultural as where you know, things are going uh, backwards and forwards, people are, are in the kind of intercultural spaces that Anthony has uh, described, that their allegiances are complex, and multiple, and people are networked in different kinds of, of ways. That a kind of intercultural, or what's sometimes referred to also as a transcultural uh, notion of what it means to promote linguistic and cultural diversity uh, may in fact be uh, a lot more enabling than some of the superficially uh, attractive uh, features of, of the multicultural that is often promoted in uh, localization uh, literature. Um, the one caveat I would uh, enter is that in Hiberno-English, uh, when somebody takes a turn, uh, it's usually for the worse. Um, if you say, oh, he's taken a bad turn, it's not uh, a very good thing. You know, um, the one thing you would not want to have happen to you in Dublin is to be taking a turn. Uh, so uh, maybe turn isn't perhaps the term that I would use, but uh, certainly interculturalism uh, and transculturalism is, is part, it seems to me, of the future of the, the discipline. Okay. Thank you. So, your comments are. Mode of development, throughout uh, the industrial mode of development, over uh, the information 